Hello, I'm Jared McFarland, Wildlife Manager and Field Supervisor for the Arizona Game and Fish Department. And today on Arizona Wildlife Views, hot, dry conditions mean you could see more of these critters invading your personal space, and we're gonna show you how to take some precautions. And later, did you know you could have a veritable medicine cabinet in your backyard or neighborhood? We'll show you some natural cures for what ails you. Plus, we've got the perfect cool spot in nearby Payson. We'll take you to a bridge not too far. We've got all this and more today on Arizona Wildlife Views. Arizona Wildlife Views is brought to you by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses and the Heritage Fund, lottery dollars working for wildlife. Some projects made possible by the Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Fund. You've all seen the recent headlines of wildlife sightings and even an occasional attack. We're here in my backyard and I'm preparing to trim my trees and shrubs. Keeping your yard trimmed nicely and uncluttered will help prevent wildlife from having a place to rest or even hide in your area. In this next story, my colleague Darren Julian is gonna show you some more helpful tips on keeping wildlife at bay. Kathy Priester's disturbing desert story is one she says she has to live with. It's not a pretty story or a story I'm proud of, but unfortunately it's a part of us now. In February, Kathy's two small dogs were attacked by a coyote right in their own fenced yard. Her dog Maggie was killed, but Maggie's sibling Corey survived. We've seen coyotes in the street, but never in our yard, never on our fence. We just never knew that a coyote could jump a fence that high. We feel tremendous guilt over what happened to our dogs. I think that we felt um, that they were safe in our yard and I feel like we just um, offered them up on a platter to a hungry coyote. They were out without supervision and I feel a lot of guilt that Maggie died. For a long time now, wild animals have quietly lived and thrived right alongside us in our neighborhoods and communities. We're in central Phoenix here and uh, coyotes have lived here for quite a long time, you know, so they're not coming from way out in the desert to come in here. As we make our cities greener, as more golf courses and beautiful lush spaces replace desert landscapes, they become more attractive to animals and humans alike. A lot of it comes down to the, these animals' comfort level. If they become comfortable living in, in our areas and they're finding their food resources and other uh, things that they need to survive, then they're gonna continue to use that. So um, be uh, aggressive or be, uh, don't be complacent when these animals are around people. The more often that they are around people, the more comfortable they feel. So you're kind of adding to the problem of them losing their fear of people. One of the things we always talk about is keep wildlife wild. You you know, don't feed them, uh, do what we can to discourage them. Arizona Game and Fish urban wildlife specialist Darren Julian has some tips to help you avoid wildlife conflicts starting right in your own home. You know, if coyotes or other critters are an issue, um, we do ask that people pick up, you know, the fallen fruit and nuts and seeds, uh, the things that we have control over. Uh, we have seen coyotes jump up and uh, pick oranges off a tree, you know, five, six feet high. So what we're asking people to do is, you know, if they can, remove that low hanging fruit. The other thing though that you want to look at is if you've got critters that are coming in and visiting your garbage, knocking it over, that kind of thing, or that's the attractant. Um, when you put your garbage out, you do want to bag your garbage. Also, you want to make sure that your garbage, is, uh, the pail itself is clean, cleaned out regularly so there's no smells or residue. Um, if they are knocking it over, you want to use you know, a secure lid, and if they're still accessing it, something as simple as a bungee cord strapped over the top, you know, keep that lid in place as well. 
And another thing that we talk about is actually excluding coyotes from your property. This is a commercial product called the Coyote Roller, found at coyoteroller.com. Uh, has to go around the entire uh, top or perimeter of your fence uh, to, to be uh, entirely effective. Uh, what happens is a coyote needs two bounds to get up and over a fence or wall. And they use their momentum to get hold of the top and then pull themselves up and over. What happens with this product is a coyote jumps up, can't get a foothold, this thing free, spins freely, and they kind of go head first into the fence or wall. This is a, a commercial product, but there's different things that are out there that you can use to modify your fencing to exclude a coyote from your yard when they've gotten very comfortable and don't run away at the side of you. We recommend using about a 10 to 20% solution of household ammonia. This stuff's cheap. You know, you can find it at every, you know, Walmart, Target, um, a hardware store that's out there. It's used for cleaning windows, that kind of stuff. But uh, very effective, very, very cheap stuff, and it's a very effective irritant. The problem becomes now, how do we get this uh, on the animal uh, to ha properly haze them. Well, we got comes the uh, super soaker type squirt gun. They make several models of these. Uh, this model shoots up to 20 feet. There's models that shoot 30, 40 feet or better. Um, and the good thing about, you know, hazing a coyote with this irritant is if that irritant is on them and until that dries and dis dissipates, uh, it's gonna affect their mucous membrane. It's gonna burn a little bit. It's not gonna cause any long permanent damage or anything like that, but it will, uh, uh, will, will burn and they'll, will, they will get the message. So what you're doing is you're effectively conditioning that coyote to avoid the location. And if they know that a human is causing this irritation, you're helping yourselves, your neighbors and your neighborhood as well. Um, I learned from Arizona Game and Fish, don't assume that your yard is safe because you have a black wall. Um, don't leave your small pet out alone because coyotes are just doing, they're all just doing what they do. They're hungry, they're trying to feed their families. Don't make it easy for them. Watch your little dogs, watch your little cats. And I just think the guilt for me is what made it my crusade. And if I save one dog because of our little Maggie, then it makes me very happy. And then she didn't die in vain. If you'd like more information on how to avoid urban wildlife conflicts, log on to our Arizona Game and Fish website at azgfd.gov slash urban wildlife. We all know that the desert can be brutal and beautiful at the same time. But did you know that it fed and healed early desert dwellers for nearly a thousand years? Choctaw Nation ethnobotanist David Morris gives tours along the Curandero Trail at the Boyce Thompson Arboretum. Simonsia chinensis. Ethnobotany is the study of edible, medicinal, and practical uses for desert plants. Today, David shows us why some of Arizona's landscape is considered a veritable medicine cabinet and food pantry all at once. Today, we're gonna to start talking about some of our prickly pear that we have here in the Southwest. It's a very useful plant for us here. First of all, edible uh, flowers are just coming on this particular plant and the flowers on many prickly pear are edible. The fruit, which will develop from the flower, is a big, usually egg-shaped purple fruit that you're probably familiar with called the tuna in Spanish. Uh, very sweet, uh, full of seeds. A lot of Arizonans take those prickly pears, remove the seeds, and make jellies, candies, and even cocktails. And then, of course, you can eat the pad itself, or the paddle they're sometimes calling it, which is the stem of the plant. Um, a lot of people like to uh, julienne it up and cook it with some onions, sauteed onions, and chili powder and garlic powder. And on a fresh tortilla, you have uh, nopalitos, con huevos. My mouth is watering, just thinking about it right here. But a very uh, a good food plant because of the chemicals that we find or the properties we find in the plant, uh, which is a uh, mucopolysaccharide. And that makes this plant what scientists now are calling an intelligent plant because it releases glucose into the body slowly. So instead of like eating a Hershey bar where you'd get a big sugar spike and then you had to come down from that, this gives you the glucose in a nice sustained manner, so much better for your metabolism, especially if you have any kind of sugar problems in your body. Uh, the other thing is, of course, this is the aloe vera of the desert. Uh, that mucopolysaccharide is the same uh, chemical element you're gonna find in an aloe. And of course, everybody knows how aloes are a wonderful healing plant. An example, 
Some people use aloe vera plants for treating burns. A small part of the plant is cut from the stem along with the thorns. The plant is cut open and the gel within it is directly applied to the burn. The gel remains on the skin until it's completely dried and absorbed. All right, now here's another one of our desert plants that sometimes looks pretty inconspicuous, but we cut this guy right in bloom and in seed. This is our uh, uh, white uh, rattani or ratni, as most of the uh, locals will call it, uh, Cromerii grayi, scientific name. Uh, it's got this nice hot pink blossom on here that's super fragrant. Uh, this plant's good uh, as a source of uh, sore throat ail uh, ailment or treatment. Uh, you, go, you get down to the root system, uh, take some of the roots, chop them up into little bitty pieces, and then you put it just into a cup of hot water to make a simple tea. Then you can use that as a retained gargle, and it's really good at uh, soothing the sore throat pains. Uh, some of our uh, powwow singers in the Native American communities will uh, chew on the root or drink the tea to keep their voices strong during the powwow ceremonies. All right, another interesting plant we have here in the desert is our, uh, one of our ephedra members. Uh, this is Mormon tea, commonly known as Mormon tea. We have about six different species of ephedra here. Uh, this actually is one of the best uh, treatments we have in the desert for allergies. So as a good home remedy for colds or allergies, the Mormon tea is the plant you're gonna look for. Some people get a little worried about using our native ephedra. Uh, because of the ephedrin that makes the uh, plant work for colds and allergies and things. And they're, gonna, they're saying, oh no, you know, we're going to uh, overdose on ephedrin. Uh, we're going to develop a tachycardia and have to go to the hospital, which uh, unfortunately happens when you use uh, the oriental ephedras, which is what we find in most of the diet drinks and energy drinks. Our native ephedra doesn't hardly have any of that chemical in it. So that makes it much safer to use for cold and uh, allergy treatments. All right, look, we have some of our uh, brittle bush that's still in bloom here. This is uh, Encelia farinosa, uh, brittle bush, one of the members of our uh, sunflower family here. And it's one of the earliest bloomers we have. Nice gray green leaf structure and then the yellow sunflower like uh, flowers here. Uh, a wonderful plant. Uh, for our Native American people and the pioneer people that came through here because this has an analgesic effect. So take some of the leaves, again, uh, uh, boil it to make a simple tea and uh, I use that as a retained gargle and it's a wonderful toothache remedy. So it helps to relieve the pains of toothaches and gum sores. David Morris says before trying any of these plant-based remedies and foods, you should always be extremely cautious. You should do your research, and you should seek out the council of experts. After uh, first being introduced to a lot of these different plants, I did take the time to do a lot of study uh, in uh, textbooks as well as with other herbalists in the area. So uh, you really need to make sure you do your homework so that you make sure you have the right plants and know what the plants are going to do for you. Nestled deep within the Tonto National Forest lies a geological wonder. It took thousands of years to form what is now believed to be the largest natural travertine bridge in the world. A prospector by the name of David Gowan discovered the bridge in the late 1870s. Gowan laid claim to the land under the Homestead Act, but ended up having his nephew, David Gowan Goodfellow take over. And they weren't your typical homesteaders. The Goodfellow Lodge was built in 1927 to house weary travelers, adventurous tourists, and everyone in between. That's how they made their income with people coming to stay to see the bridge. Under Goodfellow's stewardship, the bridge quickly became a popular attraction for visitors across the state. Arizona State Parks took over the 160-acre property in 1990. The three-story lodge boasts a sprawling lawn, covered veranda, and a gift shop on the first floor. 
when you look at that ingenuity and that perseverance, and that's something that's pretty impressive. And then to think back, they did all that, and we're still utilizing it here today. It's pretty yeah. neat, and we're just trying to carry that on. Guests can still reserve rooms on the second floor styled in quaint 20th century fashion. And what you have here in room 10 is the corner suite, which is the Gowan suite named after David Gowan, the person who settled the land. But fortunately for those just passing through, no reservation is needed to hit the trails. Well, hello, how are you doing today? Good, how are you? Good, welcome to Tonto Natural Bridge State Park. Now this whole swath of land right here is Natural Bridge. When you go on the walking path of the viewpoint, you're gonna be up on the bridge, looking over the railing down in the canyon below the bridge. Viewpoint number two is the only one on the west side of the canyon. When you're looking back at the east canyon wall, you'll see the caves and rock formations that you won't see anywhere else in the park. Awesome. Also our waterfall trail here in the middle, it's the only one that doesn't go all the way down to the creek bed. Considerably shorter and steeper, the waterfall trail offers a different picture of the park. Waterfall Trail is a unique spot you can actually see over the creek. You've got the waterfall, you've got the maidenhair fern, blackberry bushes, uh, Arizona walnut, which is a unique species, birch trees. Um, it's just a cool spot, plus it's shady and, you know, and a good escape from the heat. Novak credits the topography for the lush flora within the park. The elevation is what determines what plant species you have anywhere in Arizona. And so this is kind of unique and it is a very good elevation, especially the canyon protecting these species. These canyon walls protect more than just plants. The Coos whitetail is a smaller species of, of deer. Um, they make the park their home. They're very commonly seen here, along with the javelina, of course. Despite the occasional mountain lion or fox, javelina in the park have flourished. Even the park's smallest visitors prosper in the protected environment. But one thing brings them all together, water. Even the bridge itself requires a steady water source. Travertine, a type of limestone, forms from the evaporation of spring water rich in calcium carbonates. Spring water is now pumped over the bridge to aid in its growth, and it grows at an astounding rate of one inch every year. The Gowan Trail takes visitors through a series of switchbacks to the bottom of the canyon. At just under one half mile, the trail ends at the refreshing Pine Creek. Children cool off and sunfish bask in the protected waters, no fishing allowed. As visitors cross Pine Creek, the Travertine Bridge looms ahead, boasting a 400-foot tunnel, 150 feet at its widest point. Spring water cascades over 180 feet down into Pine Creek. The temperature under the bridge is considerably cooler, prompting visitors to linger underneath, taking in its cool mists and breezes. It feels amazing. So from Hawaii, I'm used to waterfalls. Um, they're kind of a frequent. So being in the mainland, it's kind of a rare treat because I've never got to really be in the face of a waterfall, be able to stand under one or around one. If you do make it down to the waterfall, make sure you're prepared. Um, we definitely recommend good hiking shoes and plenty of water for any of the trails because they are rated deep and strenuous. And if you're on the fence about booking an overnight stay. There is so much raw history here and you get to stay in one of the historical buildings, which I think is different than what other places do have to offer. It looks a lot like a cooking competition, but it's not a contest at all. Those are good. That's the way to eat dub. Just an occasion to make something special. Oh, yeah. That's good. And not That's good. just good food. Being together is the part that's most special for us. Making memories is really what it's all about. <laughs> Absolutely. Great memories, yeah. Great memories. For many, many years, this has been a pretty special thing. California resident Ryan Olson has been coming to Yuma, Arizona with his mom, dad, and his two brothers since he was a kid. I don't know how it started, but couple reasons, right? It's Yuma. It's just where you go. It's where you dove hunt. All the growing up years, the boys loved to hunt like their dad. And so we started out, they were our bird dogs at first. 
The hunt's a great hunt. I mean, we do it every year, and then we go back and we cook. It's the family connection. We don't even all, sometimes all get together at Christmas. The opening day of dove season has been a family tradition for more than 35 years. It's the camaraderie, it's the closeness of the family, and it's knit them together because they have this common thing. It's epic wing shooting, right? There's no way around it. It's the, it's the dove capital of the state. <laughs> it, it is a big deal down here. The historical agriculture has certainly contributed to the, the dove population down here. Grain crops are what bring in the birds, but the transition to leafy greens has been happening earlier and earlier. So farmer Trevor Cameron planted this field of milo just east of Yuma to try to keep doves in the area a little bit longer before they migrate south for the winter. The last two years we've partnered up with the Arizona Game and Fish. Uh, they've got a program where they use sportsmen's money and uh, work in conjunction with the farmers in the area where we grow fields that bring in the dove. If we're here ahead of the crowd, then we'll just park on the road up there. This year, the Olsons are planning to hunt near Cammons Field. They show up a day early to scout the area. We just rolled up on your field here. Just and like any courteous sportsman, Ryan contacts Cammon for permission and to thank him for the opportunity to hunt here. The white wing. The crops are attracting waves of white-winged doves. And as usual, Yuma is attracting hunters. Hotels, restaurants, and sporting goods stores all feel the economic impact of dove season. But the local economy is built on agriculture and food safety is always a concern. If they're harvesting or they haven't been and you've got a, a complete standing field of like this grain field, Try to stay out of it because are you going to be able to find your bird? Are you going to be able to find your shells? The decaying of an animal in the field, we have to deal with that when we're growing produce. To have this landowner give us access to this piece of property uh, is huge. And to uphold our end of the deal is how we get that repeat access over and over again. Pick up after yourself. If we can't tell you've been there, by all means, you're probably welcome next year. Stories out, three there. Hey, let's go set up a valet parking. Dove season starts a half hour before sunrise. Brutal. <laughs> the wait makes the Olsen brothers feel a little bit like kids at Christmas. Waiting for the sun to come up is like waiting for mom and dad to get out of bed. <laughs> come on. <laughs> can we get in it? Can we get into these uh, yeah. these presents? For sure. Yeah. It just kind of wafts over you, takes you back, and brings you to a, a special place. I was nine when we started this, so I'm 40, 30, 37 years 37 for me. 37 years, yeah. Straight. Crazy. Yeah. Long time. I love it. And it's fun. It's something I can say, hey, your grandfather did this with me, and um, my great-grandfather did this, so it's a lot of tradition for me. When the Olsons arrived this morning, dozens of hunters were already lining the road next to Cammons Field. There's room for all of us, we just gotta sort it out. Ryan's not concerned. He and his family are hunting the desert roosting habitat just north of the field. They plan to intercept birds that are on their way to breakfast. The Olson brothers are rallying around their mom. That's what they do, and it always feels great. It's been years since she came along on one of these hunts. Her shot's a little rusty, <laughs> but it doesn't take long for her to down her first dove. Nice. Yes. 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 Yay! <laughs> Good job, Mom. By mid-morning, everyone in the group has their limit of white-winged doves. The best part is it's only 8.15. You can't ask for a better morning. Later at the hotel, it's all hands on deck to prep the dove for cooking. The cooking piece, and growing up as a kid, we'd, we'd just breast the birds and dad would throw them on a barbecue with barbecue sauce and it was like, man, we eat them because we're supposed to eat them. That's the rules, right? Now my guys love to cook, so, you know, all of that has added to the really fun of it. This is the Dove Southwest Egg Roll. Always has been my favorite. So it has grown into this 
kind of internal epic cook-off, even though it's really not a cook-off, and we just literally do it all. You know, Wolfgang Puck would be proud of us. <laughs> I kid you not, Brandon's doing a Dove Sushi thing this year, which scares me. So I'm making Dove Sushi. Let's call it pseudo sushi. There's no fish in it, and the Dove is fully cooked. Here's our white ring roll. That's wasabi, pickle ginger, and then... Yeah. It's really good. It's fun. <laughs> it's, turning, uh, it's turning our flying Dove livers into fantastic food. <laughs> the Olsons seem to have found the perfect recipe for making memories that will last a lifetime. So for more information on Arizona's urban wildlife, please visit the department's website at azgfd.gov forward slash urban wildlife. I'm Jared McFarland, and until next time, get out there and enjoy those Arizona wildlife views. To subscribe to Arizona Wildlife Views magazine, which includes the Arizona Wildlife Views calendar, call 1-800-777-0015 or visit www.azgfd.gov magazine.